What is up, folks? Casual Dad here with another Warhammer Combat Cards Faction Guide. Uh, we're going to do something a little bit differently today. We're not going to do a single Warlord. We're actually going to do an entire faction. So, uh, with that in mind, I'm going to go ahead and focus on Tyranids because I got an actual request to do that. So we're going to focus... I'm going to run through each Warlord individually real quick, talk about what they do and kind of where they stand in the meta, um, look at a couple key Warlords, and then play at least one game, and we'll see kind of where we wind up at that point and if we'll do another one. So, from left to right, you can see six individual Warlords in the Tyranid faction. Uh, Tyranids are in kind of a weird spot, meta-wise, where they have some of the most powerful individual cards in the game and some really good Warlord abilities, but it doesn't really hold together as a deck all that well most of the time. And they're definitely one of the lesser played factions, so you don't see them all that much, so it's kind of hard to gauge where they're at. Uh, but, looking at them individually... First on the list is Zimat Haya, the <laughs> Gene Stealer Jackal Alphas. Uh, she is epic, so she does have two traits, and the trait she just gained is the Precision Shot, so when she goes on the board, she will fire a shot for a certain amount of her attack stat based on what level it is. Uh, since she is epic, she'll only ever get up to rank 2, so it's going to cap at 60% of her range stat. But kind of the key of Zima is that she gets the trait Deadshot, uh, which is the only... I think she's one of only two Warlords in the entire game who can do target acquired on a Warlord. So that gives her a big boost here, uh, her individual stats aren't all that great, even maxed all the way up. It's not bad. Uh, she's got a really decent ranged attack, but she's not terribly durable, especially looking at max level. Um, and that's definitely a challenge in the current meta where you have a lot of really, really punchy warlords that are hard to bring down and do a whole lot of damage before you get them there. Uh, but that dead shot is really valuable with her because it means that her bodyguards and her will get a damage bonus. So you get a 15% damage bonus for rank 2. Uh, but the biggest thing being that you can have your entire line, if you have two bodyguards still alive, can all shoot at the Warlord together. So she's one you definitely want to deploy once the enemy Warlord is on the table, otherwise you lose a lot of power from that. Unless you're just winning that much that it's okay to play her early. Uh, but yeah, and then her global ability is that any Tyranid card the first time it makes a ranged attack deals an additional 75% damage. It's not quite double, but in play it feels like roughly double. So if you want to do the math on that, uh, double it, round down a little bit, and maybe shave a couple extra damage off. Which is a really, really powerful ability with a lot of the really powerful shooting Tyranid cards who didn't really have a home in any of the other abilities before Zemeth was launched. Next up we have Gosar, and I'll probably get all these names horribly wrong, apologies in advance. Uh, also epic, also has two traits, got Inspire, is what he already had, and then also now has the Outflank trait to debuff the enemy. Uh, similar to Zima, he really is not all that durable. In fact, I think he's the most fragile of all the Tyranid Warlords, uh, even maxed out. He's very, very glassy. He hits incredibly hard between that Inspire and his ability, which is at the end of each player's turn, so it happens at the end of your turn and your opponent's turn, all your Tyranid cards, including those in your deck, gain plus two melee attack. So he's very aggressive, very melee focused, but since it also buffs the cards in your deck, there's a big benefit to having very durable bodyguards with him, because they can tank some damage while the other cards in your deck are building up. Uh, if you have any Furious Charge cards that will attack on drop, you want to hold them in your deck as long as you can, so that they really will pack a punch when they do come into play. Uh, he's a tricky one. Um, unlike Zima, he doesn't have the benefit of that uh, target acquired, that precision shot, so if he hits the table, you really better have that killing blow ready, otherwise he will he will struggle to compete with some of the beefier warlords, especially those who have shields. Uh, he can one-shot some, especially if you've built up his power for a while, say his outflank triggers. Um, he can land one heck of a wallop, but it better count, otherwise he's not going to be able to take the return hit. Uh, he is a challenge to work with. Um, because he's so squishy himself, I've really kind of struggled to get traction with him, even though I really like him. And these two also have the added benefit of being on the cheaper side, with, I believe, Zima being by far the cheapest. Okay. But the cost is going to ramp up very quickly. Uh, next up we have our Parasite of Mortrex. Not very popular. How does that compare cost-wise? 34, 34, yeah. So same cost as Gosar. Um, has Furious Charge, is rare. So only has the single trait, just that Furious Charge. Um, and is, I believe, the newest Tyranid Warlord. So you're not going to run into very many of these at all, and especially not very high-leveled. At high level, decent hit points. The highest we've seen so far 
Um, but no attack aside from melee, so very kind of <laughs> uh, very focused here. Um, and with the ability of explosive infestation. This is a tricky one. So the first time a card is hit with a melee attack, enemy card is hit with a melee attack from one of your cards, um, that attack does half damage, which is a real bummer. But when that card dies, it then does 40% of its base wounds as damage to adjacent cards. A couple quick things about that that are really important to note. It doesn't matter how it dies. So as long as you tag it once with a melee attack or you have a card that has death blow that dies and then will infest defending cards, um, it doesn't matter how the enemy card dies to trigger this once it's infested. Uh, that 50% less damage is a real bummer. You want extremely durable cards that can hit multiple times to trigger that. I played with this a little bit where I used Furious Charge cards and Endless cards to kind of trigger the infestation, but the problem was that then I would trigger the infestation and then have no follow-up. So uh, I've been experimenting a little bit with the Parasite, and my most successful strategy has been to just hit really hard. So you get your biggest hitters where if they deal half damage, they're still hitting for like 50 damage, and then they're able to clean up and do those infestation hits. Uh, another bonus thing about that is that infestation damage, so you can infest a card through shields, and then if you destroy a card and the adjacent cards have shields, it still will do damage through their shields. So if you can really, uh, takes a lot of strategy. So if you can put some target acquired in here, that can be helpful to kind of hit in the right places at the right times. Um, so that when these cards are have a lot of hit points, you can take them out and have them have some actual benefit. Another issue I hit with this one is you'll get three cards on a board who are infested and they'll just take each other out. So you'll have a board wipe and then you'll have to reinfest the next batch. Where ideally, you want to kind of clear a little bit around a beefy card and then have full health cards get nailed with that infested explosion when they deploy. Um, and kind of the point I keep sort of beating around there is if a card is shielded, it will take damage under the shields um, if an infested card blows up next to it. So it won't reduce the number of shields, but if you have like a 300 health card to the left of a shielded card, it's going to take significant damage when that base 300 health card dies. So that one's pretty cool. Uh, and also this is really good against Akaran because that bonus damage will take out wounded cards or trigger their second life, whatever, uh, depending on how much damage they've taken already. So it's a really cool ability. Uh, it's a real bummer with that 50% less damage, but again, if you just take your heaviest, biggest punchers and just keep wailing on enemy cards, it can be remarkably effective. Uh, and especially since at upper levels of play, you see a fair number of elite decks that have lower card count, but really high hit points, this is extremely powerful. So I actually really like the Parasite, it's one of the better ones. I like her better, or I like it, I guess better than either Gosar or Zemut. Um, Zemut may be the most powerful at the moment, uh, but kind of a bummer with her is that there are some really scary shooting decks out there that you do not want to shoot at. And since most of her decks end up being very ranged heavy, that can set you on the back foot pretty badly. Uh, I'm seeing Tau just run roughshod all over the upper Terra ranks at the moment. Um, and that's a, an ending volley you do not want to take as Zemut. Uh, especially since if you don't get those kills, you're going to be pulling healing warlords. Now you can squeeze some wins out of that because of her target acquired. You can take down Farsight or um, a Shadow Sun um, around beefy bodyguards, but it still is a risky play, and they can shoot you back. And if you don't get the kill quickly, they'll clean you up there. Um, so Parasite gets around that, so that's kind of... Uh, I, the, I would be running the Parasite a lot more if mine was higher level. This rank 1 Furious Charge just does not cut it, that 176 health. If I got even 2nd or hopefully even to 3rd rank Furious Charge, I would be playing this much more aggressively. Just because you want to do some damage on the drop and you want to have a little follow-up damage with it too. Uh, so this is one I'll be keeping an eye on as it levels up. Next up we get to kind of the classics, and you can see my levels reflect that they've been around for longer. The Turvagon was one of my absolute favorite Warlords for a long, long time, and one that I always recommend to new players because you can see just an absolute beefcake. Lots of hit points, it is expensive, um, but has an attack in every single every single rank, is also rare, so only has a single trait, but that trait is Psionic Blast, which does a reasonable amount of damage, but then also will clear shields and take out wounded cards. So this is a really fantastic endgame piece, and its ability is this thing right here. You just get a free card. Every time your Termagant card dies, uh, you just get another one, and it is shuffled back in your deck, and you can keep playing it. So that's really, really good, because you will always have something to gum up a lane, and the card itself is not bad. It's got a decent ranged attack, and has um, 
precision shot. So when it deploys, it also does damage, does range damage attack. So I've had really heavily durable decks with the Turbagon that rely on ranged attacks. And that's been really, really good. And I've gotten top 6% getting the Turbagon to like 3.3 to 3.6k trophies uh, relatively easily. Um, until the more recent meta with those secondary traits, you've got a lot more really, really hard-hitting barrage from those Tau Warlords again. And then also I'm seeing a lot of cards, um, the melee Space Marines, particularly uh, Logan, Logan Grimnar, the Space Wolf, who if he kills a card, overflow damage is dealt to the neighboring card. Against him, um, the Turvagon is actually a pretty significant downside because he can just punch right through it and it actually ends up dealing you more damage because he's killing a Turvagon to get through it because the overflow damage is 150%. So those decks are really common at the upper tiers and just completely wreck this one. Uh, also, I've seen the slightly tuned up Badruck is now a little bit more aggressive. That was always a tough matchup for the Turvagon, but now because of the additional ready and some of the other traits you see on some of those backup cards, uh, it's a much worse matchup. So I've been much less successful with the Turvagon. I do still recommend it to new players, especially if you don't have the max deck, specifically because you get a free card um, and you'll never be out of cards. So it's still a really powerful starting card, but it's definitely not the... Um, top tier warlord that she was, which is unfortunate, but that's, you know, it happens. Everyone gets their time in the sun. Uh, still really powerful, that attack at every single type. Again, also kind of talking here, I'm hitting a lot of really punchy warlords that want to fight. Like, the warlord wants to fight, and her having attack values in every trait is good, but it means that none of them are particularly high, even here. That's not going to be a punchy warlord that's going to beat anything by itself. So that's where uh, the Turbagon falls a little short. Next up, we have another rare one. We have the Flyrant, the Flying Hive Tyrant. This is one of the more durable ones because it's got fear. Uh, again, just rare, so only the single trait, but it has that fear trait and a lot of hit points, and the combination of high hit points and fear makes this a very durable Warlord one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, if you're in a game where you have enemy units at the flanks, on the wings, if they have Warlords in lanes that are unoccupied, that can be a big challenge. Um, but one-on-one, -on -one, this is when you can expect to win a lot of fights especially with that very high ranged attack that's usually pretty beefed up, but also has the fallback of any of the other uh, attack types. So this is a great one to get out of fight in the end. Also, the trait is just, at the end of each player's turn, one random enemy card loses 15 wounds. That's through shields, that's through fear, it's just a flat 15 every time. If you pile that on with poison, you've got cards taking damage very, very aggressively. So this is one that has incredible attrition, uh, which is why it's so freaking expensive. <laughs> And so the trick with this one is it's so expensive, it's a good endgame piece, but you need to soften up the enemy deck enough to not get hit from the wings with this one. So I believe that for a long time the Flyrant has been the most powerful Tyranid Warlord. I've had mixed success with it just because I haven't been able to build a deck around it that works all that well consistently. Uh, I've had some really, really good games and then some really bad games, and it's not consistent enough for me to really play it aggressively, but I've always liked this one, and I'm always keeping an eye on it, especially at this level. I've got it pretty close to max, uh, and I'm looking forward to getting up there. That rank 3 fear was a big buff, but uh, yeah, we've still got a couple levels to go. And then last but not least, we have the Warlord that's actually been the most successful for me right now in the last two seasons, and that's going to be the Swarmlord. By a mile the most expensive, well, a little bit more expensive than the Flyrant, but by far the most expensive Tyranid Warlord, but also the most durable. It has a ton of hit points, and has the base trait of shields. Uh, and then it's got the additional secondary trait. It's legendary, so it can get maximum trait rank 4 of that uh, secondary trait of Inspire, which really, I was a little dismissive of it at first because I hadn't really experienced the meta, but with that really aggressive, punchy meta, um, Swarmlord's durability holds up nicely, but offensively, it's got to also be able to fairly quickly take down enemy warlords. And I found that the Inspire gives me just enough of an edge to finish off some fights that I otherwise would have lost. So I think that was a really good balancing piece and has worked out very, very well. Uh, especially if you get a turn or two with some other bodyguards on the table, they can do some additional damage before they go down, if they do. Uh, so really, really good one. Also, the trait on this one is at the end of your opponent's turn, debuff the attack type they last used by 15%. So if you're up against a deck that doesn't have a lot of flexibility, say it's Tolmeron, for example, they're going to shoot at you pretty much every time. So every time they shoot, they start the following turn with a debuff, which is a nice way to kind of permanently reduce their offensive output. Which really helps make up for the fact that this thing is so expensive that you really have to take a pretty uh, 
reduced strength deck to run it. Also, this being legendary, it's a little bit harder to level up. I, uh, I did pay money for this one when it came out, when it was launched over a year ago at this point. So I, I started out with a bit of an edge, and I got lucky on some card pulls too. Uh, before I go into the cards a little bit, I'm going to check in on the store real fast. If you are missing Warlords, if you have a favorite faction you really want to get into, joining a clan that has that dedication can really help. And then also keeping an eye on the store for guaranteed Warlord packs. Um, you used to be able to pick which one. You'd actually be able to see which Warlord it was going to be. You can't now. Um, especially as a beginning player, one of the better ways to spend Plasma is the 150 packs with a guaranteed Warlord. Especially early on, Warlords level fairly quickly, and they're the card that's always going to be in your deck, so it's a good one to level up aggressively. I do not recommend anything higher than that. You do get another guaranteed Warlord, but this is just prohibitively expensive with Plasma, which you're going to have as a premium. Um, but yeah, so watch for your faction starter packs, watch for packs that have guaranteed cards if you do want to spend Earth monies. Um, and then, of course, watch for them in the card shop. So save your resources. Uh, focus, ideally, as much as possible, if you can. Um, but it's always very tempting just to get the extra cards that you really want. You're like, ooh, shiny. Uh, they do get you with that. So talking about Tyranids, just real quick looking at the faction. Some of the single most powerful cards in the entire faction, hands down, are going to be these two right here. So of course the Maliceptor has that Psionic Blast amazing trait, and then now also got shields and has just a bunch of hit points. Um, starts off with a pretty middling melee attack, but has a pretty high psychic attack. Uh, this is just an all-around really, really good card, even if your deck isn't a psychic or melee deck. Uh, this is still a good one to include if you can, just for the hit points and for the ability to clear weakened cards and strip shields. Great card. The next one, of course, is going to be this guy right here insane range damage, and of course has the shield trait and a bunch of hit points. If you have any kind of shooting deck, this one's very good. Uh, also good in a Gosar deck because it does have a melee attack that can be buffed, and good in a Parasite deck because it can land those, excuse me, it can land those infestation shots because it has a melee attack, but it's also very durable and has a really strong ranged attack too. Even if you're not shooting, if you're up against a heavy ranged deck, you can hit it in melee, and then shoot it back defensively when it shoots you. So this is a really, really powerful card to include, even in decks you may not always think of it. Uh, a couple other standouts. One of the biggest ones in my Turbagon deck for a long time was this guy. Just because it's got a lot of hit points, has both melee and ranged attack, has regen, uh, regens very quickly, and it's common. So I leveled it up very, very quickly. Um, and with that volume of hit points, it can stick around for quite a while if your deck has any kind of ramp. So the Flyrant likes this guy because it can just sit there and soak fire while the Flyrant's trait triggers. Uh, the Turvagon likes it because it can kind of buff up and keep your, your deck strong while you're cranking up those Termagants. Uh, pretty much every deck likes this one. But the problem is that, as you can see, all of those are expensive. So you're not really going to be able to use all of those in all of your decks. You kind of have to pick one, maybe two of them. Uh, some other standouts are going to be the Moloch. One of the hardest hitting melee cards in the game, with a huge amount of hit points and then also that death blow. This should be the linchpin of your Parasite deck. If you have it, if it has decent level, um, that death blow can trigger the Parasite attacks, it can infect cards that haven't been infected already, and it just has that flat melee, so if you get half of this, you're still hitting for, you know, 50 damage. So this is the big one I was talking about. This one's really good. A um, couple other stands out. I'm going to skip around. A lot of these cards aren't bad, but they just don't have the same utility. Like, I usually end up skipping over them when I'm deck building. This one is brand new. The combination of Barrage and Fear with a high ranged attack and a lot of hit points. This one is going to be a mainstay of my decks when I get a couple more levels in it. Um, when I get to trait rank 2 Fear, it's going to really start being great, but uh, it's definitely one that can be incredibly powerful. And in a Zemut deck, getting that Barrage plus a, a high ranged attack can really be absolutely devastating. It's also pretty good in a Parasite deck because it can um, strip shields and it has the melee attack to do the infect but also has the range damage to have an alternative way of finishing off cards once they're infested. Uh, next up is going to be this guy right here. Uh, another thing to note about Zemut is that the precision shot, the shot when you are deployed, does not count as making a ranged attack. So this guy can drop, do his precision shot, and then still get the 75% bonus range damage to shoot after. So that's a really really powerful hit. Um, this one for 40 points has always seemed a little bit glassy. I usually do take it in my Zemut decks, but I expect it to die fairly quickly, like remarkably quickly. Um, even with that 185 hit points at 40 health, 
it is enough that big game hunter is going to do extra damage to it it does not last very long so uh yeah it's a little bit tricky on that and these guys are just below that margin and this one is in particular just has a bunch of hit points uh doesn't have the attack on drop it can be a really nice sort of filler in a zima deck the one of the best melee cards in the game is going to be this guy right here has regen has a bunch of hit points has a really really high base melee attack another really good mainstay if you're doing a melee deck and then this guy the death leaper that furious charge oh man that made this thing so awesome like he's got a really high melee attack already and that furious charge this is a guy who really loves being in your gosar deck has a bunch of hit points and that furious charge on a base attack of almost 100 you have him in your deck for a couple turns and he's just coming out swinging whenever he gets played awesome card love it uh do use it a lot and you've noticed probably that i'm talking about ranged and melee those are two of the more standard attack types um i did mention psychic and i'm going to go on to that too because uh tyranids have some of the best psychers in the game hands down so they've got this guy here high hit points for a psyker a good amount of damage and then it's got brotherhood of psychers or psychic link so if you have this on the board with other psychers it's consistently throwing out over 100 damage and then you've got one of the only poison, I think maybe the only poison psyker that is also epic and now is about to unlock the warp surge so it can poison and then also do an actual shot. So it'll poison cards before it's even attacked. Uh, really good. I've been leveling these psykers aggressively, so their hit points still are not great, but uh, they're good enough that they can hang, and because of the sheer volume of damage they put out, they really do a good job um, in like pure psychic tyranid decks. Uh, there are a lot of cards to cover here, so I'm not going to talk about all of them. Note on the Psychers, uh, Tyranids do have also a lot of poison cards that can work really well. I like to include at least one poison card in any deck I possibly have, just because of shields or fear. It's a really nice way to kind of soften up those cards to make sure that they die. Um, and then if you poison a card and then it's infect infected by the ability of the Parasite, that also is a way to trigger it and have it blow up on its neighbors. Uh, I mentioned target acquired. This guy is your range target acquired. This guy is going to be your, not that guy, this guy is going to be your melee target acquired. Uh, it's good to have either or both in some decks just so you can take out priority threats. Um, I rarely find that I have the space for them in my decks nowadays, but they are cards that if you struggle with um, having positioning be kind of a challenge, those are really good ones to include. Uh, Zemut's best friend also is this guy right here. Base 40, that does, I think, almost 70 damage um, per shot with her. And if it dies, and then sh the endless part will get that bonus a second time. For five points, this thing is just bonkers powerful. It shoots so much. And then, of course, you've got your fear guy, and you've got your endless guys. Uh, Tyranids, unsurprisingly, have some of the best cheap endless cards in the game, which is awesome. But you'd be tempted to use a lot of them, and then you will just get completely annihilated by Badruck and Logan. So that's a bummer about them, is that's kind of core to the faction identity, is that like swarming griblies, and it's just a huge liability in competitive play. Uh, I'd be curious to see kind of a rework of the Tyranid faction or some more cards added to kind of help flesh this out a bit. Um, but that right now is kind of the biggest challenge, is that half the cards you can include and really like, especially as fillers, end up being a liability in play. Uh, other Furious Charge card is going to be Churda, also really good with Gosar or uh, the Parasite, because it can charge, infect, and then follow up. The challenge I hit with this guy with the Parasite, though, is like I said, he'll charge, do the Infect, and then just sort of sit there and die, uh, and block up a lane while that Infected card takes forever to die. He's really good at finishing off Squishies, so I think he's probably better in Gosar, especially because he would have his Furious Charge ramped up before he actually gets played. Uh, but yeah, so that was a strategy that didn't work with Parasite, just to go ahead and throw it out there. Unless the card is already infected and about to die, then he's great, but you don't want to apply the initial infection with a Squishy like that. Uh, but this guy, also good in Gosar because it will ramp up and it's beefed melee attack is what will trigger from the death blow. Uh, and also this one, if it blows up, will apply the Parasite's Infection to every card adjacent to whatever it blows up on. So if you put him in the middle, boom, their whole lineup is infected and you didn't even have to worry about it. And which is great too, because if the enemy card is already infected, then your follow-up melee attack will be full power instead of that 50% attack. Talked about this a lot. There are a lot more cards in here that are pretty good, but those are kind of the big standouts. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and play one game as promised, and then we'll see where we go here. So my current Tyranids are at 3k, I think just over, and I've been playing with the Swarmlord, so I'm going to show off the deck I'm using for that, just to demonstrate. 
And this is one where, because the Swarm Lord is so expensive, you gotta be really careful with what you spend points on in the deck. Uh, and all of these psychic cards are fairly cheap, aside from the Scourge of Serranus, which is just the big thing, the best thing in the world. Uh, and really benefit from having multiple psychers on the board. So if you're going to go with these cards, you want to go all in on psychers. That's something that can work for any of the Warlords, but it's particularly good with the Swarm Lord because you do not want to use melee. You want to charge up your melee attacks for your finishing fight with the Warlord. Now this is at 3k. Uh, I may get a bad matchup and we'll see how this goes, but with any luck, I should be able to just chainsaw right through this. We'll see what we get. Ooh, a Tau! Uh, good and bad. It's a squishy Tau, so I can probably finish him off, but bad in that it is going to have some really powerful ranged hits. Uh, it's not a super high trophy deck, so I'm not terribly scared of it, but you never know. I swapped that. I put the Scourge over here so he's not across from a card that will shoot, so it will not uh, lose a shield to just this guy's little shot while this taunt is up. And this is actually a pretty good matchup for the Swarm Lord, just because <clears throat> it's not Psychic. Uh, and because it's a very, very strong theme deck. So he's going to shoot me pretty much every single turn. I know that. That's going to happen. So the good thing about that is that it means that the Swarm Lord's debuff is pretty much always going to trigger, and pretty much always going to have him shooting at a disadvantage. Turn, 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 turn. And you can see how quickly these cards are burning down, but they hit so hard. This may be a board wipe. Yeah, got it. And that's the thing about it, is it's a squishy deck, but it hits so hard that it doesn't necessarily matter. As long as you have hit points to get some sh attacks off, it's enough that it will help you kind of get where you need to go in your games. And this is not going to be a board wipe for me. Let's see. Ooh, that sucks. And here, I am going to go ahead and poison this guy on the right. Uh, that would be more of a consideration if I was up against one of the... Okay. I'm play the Swarm Lord already. Uh, yeah, why not? Let's do it. He's only got one non-Warlord card left, so it's not too early to play this. Normally I would wait, um, but if I want to burn these guys down quickly and keep some of my power players up, this is a good way to do it. And you can see I'm not really, it's such a quick game that I'm not building up that melee attack much, which is where that Inspire comes into play to help kind of make up that extra difference. Oof. Oof. But you do see a lot of outflank, and um, yeah, really outflank is very common. So a lot of the time you can't rely on building up a single attack type for future turns. Now let's see here. I don't, I'm pretty sure I don't have the melee attack to kill him. <laughs> Look at that. So that's what I'm talking about. So that Inspire, that little buff is usually just enough to do pretty easy finishing games with the Swarm Lord, so. I love it when it's exact change. Sorry, I laughed there. Uh, so I'm just barely at 3k, that's another 45. It's a little bit tricky to level right now, um, just because it's the point in the ladder where you're gonna be up against a lot of decks that are ranked lower than you, uh, if you're laddering aggressively. So if I'm at 3k, my chances of losing to a deck where I'll lose like 75 or high, whereas most of my wins, I'm only gonna gain 45. It still is going to give me the majority of matches will be favorable, so it's still a good time to ladder, uh, but you do want to be careful of that. Now let me just take a look at some of my other Warlord, or my other Tyranid decks and see if I want to try another one. I may go ahead and try my Parasite jet deck just to show it, because I know that doesn't get played very much. Uh, and this one I'm still tinkering with, so I'm not totally sure I love this, but we're going to go ahead and try it. The goal is to hit extremely hard in melee, really use those in infected cards, um, and then also to prevent the Parasite itself from coming onto the board, if at all possible. And we'll see how this goes. I fully expect to lose this, unless I get a favorable matchup. Could be worse. Squishies. Good. And we got one with a nice high starting hit points. I'm going to pop this guy in the middle and see if a better target pops up. Uh, he will be going first don't want to get poisoned. Uh, is that as I said before, goal is just to punch as hard as you can. Just hit them real hard uh, so that it doesn't really matter if you're only hitting at 50% of your full melee stat. 
and we've seen two decks, and they're both really aggressive shooting decks. So this is where Zima can do really well, because she just hits so hard. But also, ooh, yeah, there we go. I mean, right off the bat. And that's really good, because I do have an empty lane. So this guy in the middle is infested, about to die. Oh, yeah. And then, so that'll set up a nice chain reaction, where as I'm killing the, the cards... The infected cards, I'll get a steady stream of non-infected cards coming through to take extra damage from that. So that was reduced damage, then, oh no! Okay. Didn't have quite enough to finish that off. And now this would be a really great spot to have uh, Churdo. Churdo could finish this guy off and then take out the poison guy, but that's alright. So I should be able to polish off, yeah. And so that's bad. <laughs> I know that may seem counterintuitive, but the thing is now I have to reinfest the entire new line of cards. Uh, I don't have like a bomb building that's gonna trigger on a new card, ooh. But it still is not that bad. I'm still not that close to losing either of my power pieces. So I should get a little bit more utility out of this and I should be able to finish this relatively easily. And this is something you would generally consider to be a bad matchup for the Parasite, because this is a fairly aggressive... I do want that dead. Mm, how are we gonna, yeah, let's do that. It's a fairly aggressive shooting deck that has some durability, but has a lot of... Usually you'd see on a... Oh, what's his face? Ooh, this is gonna be good. So that's gonna explode and kill him. And then the overflow damage did all kinds of chaos over there. So that was just a giant mess. <laughs> That's one of the fun things about the Parasite, is you just see, like, complete ridiculous stuff going on. Uh, and so I'm going to put up some ablative cards here. I don't think he has enough to queue with that ready. He does. Wow, max level. Uh, so I may actually still lose this. 54, dang. Okay. I'm hoping not. Oof. That's gonna hurt. Now that's gonna infect the two cards that haven't been infected yet. Now here's where it gets tricky. Because my Parasite doesn't hit very hard. I want to kill the Kairos and Nail over here. Ah. So I lost this. Because I have to block Mogan Ra over here because if he shoots me, he will kill me. Or if he, yeah. So I don't think I had that. Unless, by some miracle, this Keros and Nail had enough. No, it's not gonna do 100. No. So it ended up pretty close. Um, if my Parasite was just a hair higher level to do that extra 25 damage, I could have had that. But that is exactly why you don't wanna run the Parasite at low level. But uh, that showed how you can kind of play the deck. It wasn't the best matchup, thing about Zephyrblade is that you have a combination of extremely durable cards that are hard to kill and then very squishy cards that are easy to kill but don't give you much benefit because when they blow up, they didn't have many hit points to blow up with. So, and eh, that's a thing. Uh, let's go ahead and give one more game a go. Let's take a look at these decks. I may go ahead and do Zima because again, that's one that's in a better kind of meta spot right now. For those new players, these are sorted by cost. So if you're looking for a specific Warlord, look around the points cost range for that Warlord. Um, fairly quote-unquote standard, this deck. Really heavy on the hard range titters with a couple squishier ones in there just to fill. Tried to have a full deck because, again, you want to control... Ooh, hello. You want to control when Zemut goes into play. Let's try that again. Uh, so you can see I've got the five points there. I've got my um, Inspire guy here. But then it's backed up by three very, very durable cards. See if that'll work again. Okay. Whoa. Okay. So I just lost. I lost a game I probably really wasn't supposed to. Um, and so that means that I would take a pretty significant penalty in trophies. Um, and then I got the dubious honor and follow up of going up against a 3.5k trophy Akaran deck. Yuck. 
Uh, the good news about that is this is such a hard-hitting deck, and I am going first because she's relatively quick, um, that I should actually be able to punch through these. Now I lose a fair amount of damage, like this guy's going to hit incredibly hard, but it's not going to matter because it's just that 5 health secondary death from Akaran. I feel like there should be... I'm not going to vent, just a little soapbox here. I feel like there should be a limit on that where Akaran... There should be some sort of threshold where Akaran just doesn't tank the damage because at the moment it's like it does not matter how much damage he takes, he will come back, and that dude is going to have 5 health left over. Which is dumb. Um, just because you can hit a card for like 400 damage, and it comes back with 5 health, no matter what. doesn't matter. Which is another reason why you're seeing those overflow damage cards just become so popular, because nobody wants that to happen. Uh, if you have Barrage, you at least feel like you're doing something, because you do a lot of damage, so, because you do damage to the adjacent cards, even if your base card does nothing. Uh, da, 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 da. Still need to clear that shields off that guy. And it's easy to forget, but remember that the little surgeon over here does have a ranged attack too, and he also has that bonus damage on it, so he can hit quite hard. And normally if I'm playing a melee deck, this guy is just the absolute bane of my existence. He's just constantly debuffing your melee. Um, and it's really annoying with my Swarm Lord because he does the same thing, and I'm trying to build up that melee for the end game. But uh, it's just fine here. Ooh, melee, interesting. This is where I wish they were flipped because that. Ooh, yeah, let's give you a little poison, buddy. I may regret not having that on uh, Akaran himself, but that's okay. Oh yeah, we gotcha. And now Zima is a decent matchup against Akaran because of that target acquired, but also, as you'd expect, that target acquired is a big problem for her. Um, well, Akaran is a big problem for her because your entire target acquired could get eaten by shields. Nobody wants that. And that's a good highlight to show off how useful that uh, Barrage is against Akaran, and how wonderful it is to have a card that's very durable that has that. That guy is such a good card, and he's only going to get better as my uh, card's level. Sweet. Okay. So that is the AI doing something dumb. He needed to kill this area effect guy. He's going to die, but he will in the process. Let me take down Nyal. Which is what I needed. I needed to kill Nyal. Um, oh yeah, <laughs> and he's gonna do it again because he's gonna keep doing psychic attacks, um, because the AI is kind of dumb. Ooh, interesting. Okay, that was a bummer. And now here we have a really awkward situation. Uh, so again, I need to defend the lane because Zima is not that durable. Um, but then I lose a whole lot of range damage from this guy. Yuck. Okay, so I'm going to lose this one too. But I hope that this did kind of show the power of these decks and kind of how to play them, but also where they're kind of butting heads with things in the meta right now. Um, this was a, a bad matchup. Fortunately, it doesn't matter too much in terms of trophies. Um, just because it's, this deck is rated so much higher than I am that losing this isn't going to completely destroy my record, but um, Akaran is another one of those decks that benefited hugely from the secondary traits additions just because of some bodyguards. Uh, there are a lot, a lot of the decks in play do... I only lost 12 trophies. That's good, so I lost 12 trophies. But that was a perfect case of where Zemut can struggle. She does so much burst damage, but if you're up against a deck where you have to kill cards twice, that burst damage just falls a little bit flat and you end up a little bit weak in the end game. Um, I'm going to try the Turbagon, just to go ahead and show it, because it's my old favorite. I fully expect to lose that game, especially since I'm about due for a match with Badrak. And then we'll leave it at there. I know that's been a lot, um, and it's been long. If you're still with me, appreciate it, but uh, yeah, I'll try not to keep you too long here. Ooh. Well, whether this is a bad matchup or not depends on what cards he's got. If he goes ranged, that's fine. If he goes melee, that's bad. I'm going to drop this gun here. 
Uh, note for the Turbigon, unless you're up against Badrock, if you are able to, always play your Turbigant first. Because you're going to get it back. Okay, that's your bummer. So I also have reworked this deck to be Psychic Heavy, which is something I had forgotten. Okay, but he's shooting, so the advantage to that is he's going to shoot at me, so I can shoot back. But I am, as you saw, as I noticed, up against Manifest Nightmare, who and Necrons have no psychic attacks, so Manifest Nightmare's ability is always going to trigger to reduce my incoming damage. I'm just going to make this a very slow, obnoxious game to get through. But we will make it through, won't we? But I don't think you need to see the end of this game. This is going to be a really slow one, so I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. Um, I hope that this has been helpful. If you do have any other questions about Tyranids or want to tell me I'm completely wrong, <laughs> uh, please do. I'd be happy to hear it. And if there are any other videos you want to see as a follow-up, I was specifically asked to do kind of a Tyranids faction breakdown, and that's why I did this video. So, yeah. If you want to see more, let me know.